Chapter 39. My Return to Texas. After moving back to Texas in August 1984, my wife and I enrolled both of our sons in school, Jason in the first grade and Chad in kindergarten. I then got a call from David Manning, who was Booker Ken Mantell's assistant, saying that he wanted me to come into the office and meet Chris Adams. When I got to the office, it was just David, Chris, and I. Chris and I started talking, and although I knew he was an excellent wrestler and a performer, I also learned he was a judo champion, and that his brother was the judo coach for the British Olympic team. After getting to know each other better, I told Chris that I had left Texas under extremely bad circumstances just under two years ago, and then when I came back for the Texas Stadium show, I had flat out refused what Ken Mantell wanted me to do. I even warned Chris if we team up, I might have some heat with people that won't give you a fair opportunity. David quickly assured us that wasn't the case, and Chris was confident enough in our abilities to want to give it a try. Then, I told Chris the same thing I told every guy I ever teamed up with. When the day comes that you're no longer happy with me, please let me be the first one to know. Then, we'll shake hands and go our separate ways. A few days later, I got a call from Ken Mantell, who told me he was overjoyed that I was back in Texas, and that Fritz wanted to see me in his office before the TV taping that night. As soon as I walked into Fritz's office, he said, it's good to have you back. How are the boys? I told him both of them were enrolled in school. And then I asked about Doris and his sons. We talked for a while about the regular stuff that guys who haven't seen each other for a while talk about, and then we went over our deal, he was responsible for Chris Adams financially, and I was responsible for him creatively. I was responsible to promote him, pick his opponents, and put him in programs that would be best for him. I would also make the decision when to drop him off the main event and give him wins on TV to regenerate him. All of those things are very important, because so many guys get lost in the shuffle, or get to the top and after an eight-week run they're finished because no one is watching out for them. It was the same deal I had with Fritz when I came in with Don Jardine 17 years ago, so it wasn't like I was striking a new deal with him. It was our deal. After Fritz and I shook on our deal he hit me with, now I would like you to do me a favor. I want you to go up Ken and apologize for the trouble you caused him in May. What are you talking about? I asked. You know, he wanted the great Kabuki to take the fall and you refused. No, Fritz. I won't apologize for taking care of my gimmick and Jimmy Crockett's business. If that's what's required of me, then our deal is off. At that point he backed off and said, okay, fine, but I want you to be nice to Ken. I assured him, Fritz, I have never been anything but nice to Ken Mantell. Ken was the booker and I respected that. I never pushed my weight around unless it came to the wrestlers I managed, but I didn't care if it was Jim Barnett, Jim Crockett, or Bill Watts. No one messed with my talent, because that was the promise I made to the wrestlers I managed, to protect them and look after their best interests. At the time that I started managing him, Chris Adams was equal in popularity to the Von Erichs because of his feud with Jimmy Garvin, who was generating a lot of heat with his manager, Sunshine. The office felt it would be really hard to switch Chris over, but I personally thought it wouldn't be a big deal at all. Not only did I think that Chris had the talent for it, but the fans were craving a good, solid heel. Aside from Jimmy Garvin, the lead heels at the time of my arrival were Killer Khan and The Missing Link, a couple of gimmicks, and not a competitor among the bunch. No one was paying money to watch them fight the Von Erichs, and the boys were basically without any real challengers. And in Texas, if the Von Erich boys didn't have someone to fight, there was no business, so I knew there was a lot riding on the success of Chris's heel turn. After Chris signed with me on TV he continued wrestling as a babyface and as a tag team partner to the Von Erichs, the first time I ever had any kind of friction with Ken Mantell was when he wanted to do the switch right away. I told him, I don't think that would be good. When the people first see me with Kevin or Kerry at ringside, because I'm Chris's manager and it's a tag team match, they'll wonder what is going on. It will be better to lull them into a false sense of security, that maybe this is a workable thing. I always believed in double-crossing the fans, and never wanted them to know what was coming next. I like that, and I think the fans like that, but the powers that be wanted the money in the house as soon as possible. In any event, during Chris's matches where he would team with the Von Eric boys, I would become very bossy to Kevin and Kerry, acting like I was their manager, and shouting orders at them to do this and that. Sometimes they would listen to me, and sometimes they would stop and yell at me to back off. I would just keep yelling at them to work on the arm. They would, but they would resent it. One day after a match, I jumped in the ring and put my finger in Kevin's face, telling him he had to listen to me. He blew up and knocked me on my ass causing Chris to superkick him, and we were off and running. The Chris Adams and Kevin Von Erich feud became so hot that we took it to the Cotton Bowl, where Chris hit Kevin over the head with a wooden chair. 
As I pulled Chris back, I noticed that he had horribly opened Kevin up on his skull. Blood was just pouring out of his head, running onto the mat, and the people in the audience were traumatized. Girls were literally crying. Chris and I had to walk 40 yards to get to the back, and if it hadn't been for Dallas's finest, we never would have made it. After a while they brought in a medevac, put Kevin on a stretcher, and left the cotton bowl with sirens blaring. Later that night Baylor Hospital received so many calls about Kevin's situation that they requested all four new stations run bulletins, saying that Kevin was at the hospital, resting comfortably, and in stable condition. That was really something. Then I put Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez together as a tag team, and they began using the entrance song Bad to the Bone, by George Thorogood and the Delaware Destroyers. Chris and Gino made a great team, and really were a dynamic duo. I always had a happy family around me, and I made it very clear to them both, we're going to make a lot of money together, and have a lot of fun together. When we stop having fun, then it's time for us to split up. I didn't want or allow any dissension or turmoil within my group. I made it clear to them both that it was the group of us that could get us to the next level, and not the individual. Luckily, they got along very well. Gino got along with everyone, though. He was a sweet, wonderful kid, and understood that I was bringing him into an angle where Chris was situated as the lead heel. Gino was not a petty, jealous, or vindictive person, and would give anyone the shirt off his back. And over time, Chris and Gino became really good buddies. By putting Chris with Gino, it enabled us to do some tag team matches with Kevin and Carrie. I felt that Carrie had really been diminished by only holding the NWA title for a short time, and it showed in business. When he lost the belt so suddenly in Japan, it was a big letdown, and it took the heart out of the fans. David dying earlier that year under suspicious circumstances also took the heart out of the people. Therefore, as good as business was with Chris and Gino, it wasn't up to the level of the fabulous Freebirds and Christmas 1982. Chris and Gino also teamed with Grizzly Smith's son Jake Roberts, to win the six-man tag team title at the Cotton Bowl. At the same time Nick Roberts, who promoted Lubbock, got his daughter Nicola a job as Gino's valet, and she would ironically later marry Jake's brother Sam Houston in the Carolinas. Eventually, Ken Mentel came up with this brilliant idea to bring in Sunshine's aunt, Stella Mae French, to feud with us. Ken must have had a crush on Sunshine or gotten some perverse pleasure just from the mere mention of her name, because she was seemingly intertwined in every single one of his angles, and why Stella May had to be Sunshine's aunt is beyond me. Anyways, Stella was an old girl wrestler than Ken knew from Louisiana, who was now driving big rig trucks. One night before a show, Ken asked me to go out and slap Stella May around. I said, you've got to be crazy. I'm not going to hit a woman. He insisted how great it would be if I got into a fight with her, so I compromised by saying I would insult her, but I wouldn't raise a hand to her. There were certain things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't go out and demean homosexuals like I was asked to do in Amarillo by Dory Funk. Senior, I wouldn't support the Holocaust like Bill Watts wanted me to do in Florida, and I wouldn't beat up a lady. I didn't care if someone gave me all the money in the world, that was my code, it served me well in wrestling, and I just wouldn't go against it. Because I was steadfast on my refusal to hit Stella May, Ken took me out of the scenario with Chris and Gino, and I was no longer their manager. When I learned of Ken's decision, I told Chris and Gino I would do anything I could to help you get over, but I also know what's right and what's wrong. When I'm asked to do something that I know in my heart is wrong, I can't do it. But if you want to continue with this angle, God love you both, and I hope you do wonderful. That's how my managing Chris and Gino ended, and there were no hard feelings. Of course, the Stella May angle went into the toilet. <laughs>